All right. Uh, well, it's my pleasure today to introduce the prominent historian, Professor Robert Bothwell. Uh, I'll read uh, a bit uh, from the uh, academic uh, bio, and then I will uh, quote some of his own words, which are a lot livelier than mine. Um, yes, sir. Yes, uh, Bob uh, earned his uh, um, BA at uh, U of T and his PhD at Harvard. He was director of uh, the International Relations Program at Trinity College, uh, U of T, and he remains a fellow there. He is a professor of Canadian political and diplomatic history, and he holds the May, Glush uh, May um, Gluskin Chair of Canadian History, in Canadian History. His research interests include modern Canadian history and political, diplomatic, and military history. His books cover uh, these uh, areas, uh, as well, and specifically as well, Pierre Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau's foreign policy and the development of Canadian nuclear energy. His works on Canadian foreign policy include Canada and the United States, uh, Canada and the World, 1945 to 1984, the Penguin History of, of Canada, and uh, more recently, Your Country, My Country, a, a unified history of the United States and Canada, which I would very much like to read and uh, make it a point. He was awarded the J.B. Tyrrell Historical Medal by the Royal Society of Canada and the Order of Canada. Uh, now, in his own uh, lively words, he recalls that his uh, U of T studies were followed by Harvard and studies with Ernie May, James Q. Wilson, and Robert Wolf. The latter was a, uh, help me here, Bob, Byzantinist or Byzantinist? That's okay, we'll leave it. <laughs> uh, who had never actually had a modernist history student enrolled with him before. Not only was Wolf's subject inherently interesting, he thought it is uh, panache. He was a super, superb lecturer and fine teacher and supervisor. At Harvard, uh, uh, Bob first learned the pleasure of teaching undergrads. Uh, he emerged as a fledgling diplomatic and institutional historian and was hired not to teach that subject at the U of T, rather to the surprise of his supervisor. May, who had nothing to do with the process. Like virtually every hire around 1970, he arrived ABD. The thesis would only be ground out two years later. Uh, U, of T, U of T had changed. The honors courses were gone. Marxists, even communists were in evidence. The SDC, SDS was in flower. Uh, the air at parties was pungent with harsh, <laughs> and sometimes Bothwell was the only Canadian in a room full of Americans who had come to Canada for, for, their, for their health, physical, physical and mental in the case of the men, and mental and moral in the case of female draft resistors. Uh, what, what he enjoyed most about his long career was his undergrad teaching, which he never viewed as divorced or separate from his research and publishing. Several of his more than 20 books were uh, tried out first uh, on these undergrad courses, one of which on Canadian foreign relations, he has taught to thousands of students for 46 years. Uh, I will uh, stop there with my introduction. There will be a lot more to say, but uh, what we hear from Bob will be more interesting. <clears throat> this is a pretty good uh, illustration of why I became an historian and not uh, an engineer. Um, it was really clear to me from uh, my last years in high school that um, McGill and Queens were not for me because they had a science and math requirement and U of T did not. U of T was um, content with Latin. And I suppose that Latin uh, thread uh, leads all this uh, all this way to um, to Nero. It's my fifty eighth year. <clears throat> well, it's fifty eight years since I came to U of T, um, to a city that I had uh, never visited, and a university 
that I only knew about because my friends were going there. And so, uh, plus, of course, I'd heard about uh, student initiations at Queen's and uh, I discovered uh, an earlier version to barbarism. Um, so <laughs> Margaret McMillan and I talk about this quite a bit because we were uh, classmates. And um, we agree, I think, that we got a fabulous education at U of T. Uh, the course was called Modern History, uh, but that's not actually the case. Uh, we were uh, graduates in British history, which was assumed to cover the world and uh, which was uh, enthusiastically propagated by our um, uh, teachers. And uh, when we went our separate ways, she to Oxford and I to Harvard, uh, we found that our um, U of T undergrad education had really served us quite well. Um, in my case, I was dealing with the grinding American, um, <laughs> uh, what can I call them, um, my fellow students, and she had to cope with the bullshit that Oxford regularly doled out <clears throat> as a, a substitute for um, uh, academic discussion. So I, uh, I came to U of T in 1970. I almost missed it because the hall porter in my house at uh, Harvard um, had misplaced it. <clears throat> there was a letter and I finally got a, a note from Ken McNaught or a phone call from Ken McNaught um, saying, um, what are you going to do with our offer? And I said, what offer? And uh, so by accident, I got um, an appointment in the history department. I was not the only person hired by accident. Um, we hired our Chinese historian entirely by accident. We got the wrong guy. But since he'd arrived, <laughs> we kept him on. I mean, the U of T in those days, Canada in those days, the world in those days had a, a rather charming aspect, uh, which was um, not hapless, uh, but certainly, um, certainly unexpected. Now, when I arrived at U of T, I was the youngest member of my department, and um, I was actually age 25. And um, this is something that I've learned to conceal from today's graduate students, um, because it frequently um, occasions a certain grinding of teeth and a reddening of the eyes and rising of the fur on the neck. Uh, but that, of course, was the world of 1970. And as Peter quoted me, it was also a wor world that was um, <clears throat> adrift in a cloud of marijuana and hash. Um, fortunately, like Bill Clinton, <clears throat> I did not smoke. And <laughs> not being able to smoke, I really <laughs> never, never did more than sniff the product that was drifting from other people's nostrils. Um, but I can certainly claim that whenever I walk down Blur Street or around the university, if it's not G10, uh, then it's definitely, uh, definitely marijuana. Um, Peter referred to my teachers at Harvard, and that is somewhat getting into the background of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, my thesis supervisor was Ernie May, uh, and Ernie was um, young, comparatively speaking. He was 39. And he spoke with a very soft voice. And he was shy. And uh, he was absent minded. I've tried to um, model myself at least on that last characteristic. And uh, so I was the one in the seminar who was said to knock on his door and say that the seminar was meeting and would he like to be there. Um, so that was Ernie, uh, who I, I liked very much. Um, but really, the main influence in history on me was a man named Robert Lee Wolf. Um, his name, as we can tell, of course, is now likely to be uh, censored. But um, I mean, he was not responsible for his name, poor soul. And uh, he was, he weighed 300 pounds um, and he had been the chairman of the department. Um, at an earlier stage in his life, he had been in the OSS and he had been parachuted into Romania. Obviously in those days, he did not weigh 300 pounds or there would not have been a parachute that could carry him and the Germans in any case could have spotted him in the sky and shot, at him, shot him down. I dated his daughter. Um, so I can say that um, 
we, um, we got along, I think, marvelously well. My first lecture ever <clears throat> was actually not in Canadian history. It was not in international relations. It was not the British Empire. These were all areas that I was actually qualified in. Um, it was, in fact, in Byzantine history. Um, because a friend of mine who was teaching at the University of Ottawa had taken sick and begged me to take the class. It was a dreadful lecture. <clears throat> and it was dreadful because I arrived with a sheaf of notes that I had spent the pre previous week uh, sort of swatting up. And um, it taught me a lesson, which is that I never lecture from notes. <clears throat> um, I never speak from notes. The very few occasions that I've been forced to do it, uh, the results have been disastrous. So um, you can be assured that if you don't like what I have to say or the way I'm saying it, it could be worse. And, uh, and it has been in the past. Of course, you know, we're all familiar with the old undergraduate critique. Um, you know, the professor arrives with a sheaf of yellowed paper and uh, these were his notes and they'd been the same from year to year. No student can say that of my courses. Once one came up and said, I was at your lecture last year and you've said something completely different. You contradicted yourself. And I said, well, you know, I've just changed my mind. But in fact, I had no memory of what I'd said the previous year. Uh, you know, this is what I thought now. And, uh, and that was the way uh, it was going to be. Um, and I've been very fortunate uh, to be at the University of Toronto um, it has its aggravations, as I'm sure absolutely everybody here can testify, but um, we float on a wave of undergraduate excellence, and that was true when I lectured to engineers um, with Morris Careless. Um, it's been true in the 40 odd years that I've been teaching international relations in conjunction with uh, various dear friends. Um, and in fact, um, what I'm talking about today uh, is associated with my current seminar because um, next week we are actually going to sit down and discuss uh, Donald Trump and the Emperor Nero. And um, this is a very unusual assignment these days. I think it would not have been as unusual when we were undergraduates, at least looking at the array of um, gray heads in front of me. Um, I, I think we were all probably undergraduates about the same time. And in those days, uh, classical history was much more closely associated with the um, history that we generally teach in history departments. Um, and I don't mean that as particular criticism or um, as an attack on any particular area of uh, history as it's taught today. Um, however, um, it, uh, it occurred to me looking at my very bright seminar. I mean, I've got my, uh, <clears throat> my wish. Um, I have a seminar of six, which because I am getting rather deaf, I thought I could actually manage with around a table. And uh, I chose my room very carefully, uh, as small and with good acoustics. And I looked forward at the end of every uh, seminar to going off to the Harvard House with my class and um, <clears throat> continuing the discussion, uh, as we say. And then COVID occurred and um, all of those plans went, um, went down the drain, so to speak. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, the pleasure of having a limited course in numbers and a course that says permission of instructor and permission of instructor was granted if somebody had an A average, um, <clears throat> really created the absolutely ideal conditions for me. And you may wonder how on earth I got away with that. And the answer is, well, of course, not to work for the regular university, but for Trinity College and at a salary that caused the de dean's eyes to overflow with tears as he fell before me and kissed my hand. My salary is zero. <clears throat> uh, so in the days of COVID, I like to think that I've made my contribution uh, towards the university budget and saving us from bankruptcy. Obviously, 
the absence of my salary will do a great deal uh, to make up for the uh, for the deficit. Um, so this year, I decided that we would be right up to date, which is not common in a history course. Um, but the reason I decided that we would do uh, Nero and Trump together was that I thought there was a real deficiency in the way that the Trump era was being described. I mean, both by um, journalists and uh, by political scientists, even good ones. And um, it seemed to me that the, it, it was all being described in more or less rational terms. <clears throat> I mean, a rational approach, of course, would say, well, you know, Trump is uh, ignorant, and that's certainly a rational comment, and uh, I think an accurate one. And someone would say, might say, well, you know, he's shallow, and I think, well, that's fair enough. And, um, you know, so a lot of the discussion about Trump goes on in those terms. And that's even true in Canada, you know, where we employ platoons of diplomats and other public servants uh, to try and analyze Trump, um, analyze the United States and see what Canada, which is, um, I won't use the awful word dependent, but you know, which is dependent on the United States uh, for a great many things, including trade uh, and defense. So um, it matters a lot to us. But again and again, and I'm sure that some of you out there are addicts to CNN or MSNBC, and they summon <clears throat> their experts who come in in groups of three, and, and they all sit there as though this is for real. <clears throat> you know, they're all sitting there talking about details of politics and precedents and, um, well, what can one call it? Habits. Um, Precedents. And precedence is something that historians have learned to be allergic to. You might think that precedent is all when it comes to history, but historians, I think, should be aware of the vagaries of human existence and human uh, psychology. And it occurred to me that only a small group of people had actually got Trump right in the first instance. And that was a group of psychologists and psychiatrists uh, who got together and published in the summer of 2017, a book on Trump's psychology. And of course, if there are any psychologists there, psychiatrists, um, apart from wanting to make me one of your subjects, um, the, it, there is a, an ethic to the practice of psychology and uh, psychiatry. Um, and there's also an intellectual barrier, which was explored by Sigmund Freud uh, back at the end of World War I, where with uh, William Bullitt, he actually attempted a psychological or a psychiatric biography of Woodrow Wilson, uh, which was so dreadful <clears throat> and so biased and so unconnected to any serious evidence that it has discredited the idea of psychiatric biography ever since. But as the psychologists and psychiatrists reasoned, this was different from any other time. Trump was different. He was dangerous in their opinion. And therefore it was incumbent on them to use what they knew, to use the public and video and oral record and try and make an assessment of Trump that would be, um, well, a useful guide. Uh, for people. Now, the problem with that kind of thing is that it's so depressing that you would really rather that it were not so. And so a great deal of wishful thinking has gone on about Donald Trump, even though if you really press people, they will say that they think that he has um, a screw loose, and, um, which is, a, of course, a, a scientific term. Um, and um, I noticed that I have an ally uh, in this, for if you've been reading today's papers, because I like to keep right up to date. Um, and there is a new uh, witness, a new uh, analyst 
of Donald Trump. And now, of course, if you were an undergraduate class and I was standing in the Ignatio Theater, I would ask you to come forward with who this person might be. And uh, but I'll save you the, the pain of, of guessing. Uh, it is that great authority uh, and moral wunderkind, uh, Steve Bannon. And Bannon today <laughs> said that he thought that Trump had early stage Alzheimer's, not just now, <laughs> but back in 2017. Uh, this is the man to whom Trump gave a pardon. <clears throat> I suppose in the belief that this guy uh, resembled him in many respects, lack of ethics, um, lack of scruple, uh, strong incentive to cheat and so on. And here is Bannon who's been absolutely Trump-like because his response to Trump's largesse, saving him from prison is this. And, you know, I, I can't wait for Trump to advance to the uh, gates of Mar-a-Loco, his estate in, in Florida, and, um, <clears throat> and come up with his latest uh, denunciation of this latest ungrateful person. Um, so to know Donald, uh, it's obviously not to love him, but let's go back. I mean, I, I suggested that there was a lack in the journalistic and analytical academic approach to, uh, to Trump, um, particularly from political scientists, um, who I think really, you know, when they get their doctorates must go somewhere and get injected with a kind of optimism serum. Um, the optimism serves two purposes. One is to persuade them that they actually are a science. And the other, uh, of course, is to give them some hope uh, for the future, uh, which they then peddle. Um, well, you can see that I've been on panels with political scientists <laughs> on the subject of Donald Trump. And I, I have to say about halfway through it, I'm usually looking at these people <clears throat> and wondering if they too are not suffering from early onset Alzheimer's. Um, the, the problem um, is the attempt, the desire to discuss Trump in rational terms. Now, if you take it one step up and you go to the conduct of foreign relations, or if you go into the area of policy, there is a point to this, but it's a different kind of point and is subject to major qualifications that are not usually present when you're discussing uh, the conduct of foreign relations and foreign policy. Well, when this project was first bruited, um, I think, strange as it may seem, the true awfulness of Trump <clears throat> had not been absolutely evident. I mean, we have had uh, what I agree uh, is an attempted coup uh, in Washington uh, a month ago. Um, it does set records, I think, in terms of its incompetence. It's up there with the cap putsch in Berlin in 1920 and some of the other failed um, putschist exercises. Um, but I do agree that it was uh, an attempted uh, coup d'etat and analyses of Trump now take a rather darker tone. <clears throat> so that when I, was, um, when I was conceiving this or tossing it around in my mind, um, I must admit the image of uh, Peter Ustinov came to mind. And what the hell does Ustinov have to do with Donald Trump and Nero? Well, of course, he played Nero. In fact, I think it's Ustinov's absolutely best role. And um, perhaps he came to the, uh, to the role because of his connections with the Russian aristocracy. If you're wondering what happened to them, well, uh, there are a number who ended up as actresses and actors. Um, and uh, Helen Mirren, for example. And so, Usanov gave a performance that I, I must admit um, is, is one of the funniest I've ever seen. Um, and in some ways, a proper reaction to nastiness, folly, evil even, is humor. I mean, Charlie Chaplin showed this in The Great Dictator uh, when he took off after Adolf Hitler. Um, it shows up in British propaganda during World War II, again with Hitler um, 
marching back and forth to the tune of doing the Lambeth Walk. And to some extent, I must admit that I do feel sometimes that Trump could be a figure of fun. And perhaps in the future, when we're out of his immediate presence and the sound of his voice, and he is safely gathered to his fathers, who include a grandfather who ran a brothel in the Yukon. Um, I mean, Trump comes by his character, quite honestly. And let us always remember there is a Canadian component, even in evil. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I sort of thought, well, maybe, you know, let's, let's try at least and see the ironic version of Trump. And so Peter Ustinov plays Nero in an, an, a truly awful movie um, called Quo Varus, which is based on the uh, novel by a Polish novelist in the 19th century, which I found unreadable. Um, I'm sorry if there are any Polish scholars present. Um, but the movie, the movie fitted in well to the culture of North America, the West perhaps, in the early 1950s, uh, which was a, a rigid culture and a culture that prized a kind of treacly religiosity. And we used to call it the Yay Verily uh, series of movies. I mean, you know, you always felt that if you ran into one of these characters uh, and you asked them a question, they would say Yay Verily. And so, <clears throat> and this one, um, uh, is based, interestingly enough, very largely on the work of the Roman historian Suetonius, um, and um, also on Tacitus, and there are a few other Roman historians uh, tossed into the mix. Uh, and it's seldom that you can see a pretty direct link between somebody who wrote in the second century and the, the product of a, a Hollywood studio. Green and do that. If I can find it here. It's gonna take me a second, hold on. <laughs> it's wonderful. Millions of persons have already seen and applauded MGM's mighty technical spectacle. Nero's pagan Rome in all its dissolute splendor. The most wicked era of history comes to life. Three flaming love stories. <laughs> the pagan soldier or the beautiful Christian captain. The tragic love of the sultry slave girl for her master. The tortured love of cruel Nero or his wicked empress. Three hours of eye filling enjoyment. Three years in the making. 30,000 in the cast. You'll never forget its unequal spectacle. You always remember its heart pounding gun. You've got one brief glimpse of Nero in that uh, in that trailer, and it's Peter Ustinov sitting off to the side, and he's got a crown of leaves, gold leaves, on top of his head, and he's looking petulant. And um, in some respects, you know, that is um, close to Trump, except that I have to say that Ustinov's voice is much gentler on the ears uh, than is uh, Trump's Queen's accent. Um, there's something else that links that <laughs> sequence to Trump, and that is the parade. <clears throat> Quite clear that Trump loves a parade. I mean, one thing that uh, really stuck out in my mind was when Emmanuel Macron invited him to Paris for um, Bastille Day. And Trump was obviously deeply moved. I mean, this, this was something where a foreign leader had an impact on Trump. 
And that was that Trump just loves parades. I mean, he likes marching soldiers. He likes the spectacle. And of course, Trump is an entertainer. And in many respects, uh, so was Nero, although I, I suspect what Hollywood did in the movie in terms of spectacle and marching troops and so on is better than anything the Romans actually could have done. And there was a sequence there, if you noticed, where um, it's the Hollywood version of the June Taylor dancers who used to jump around Jackie Gleason. Um, and so it's really, it's, it's a wonderful link. Now, I don't necessarily want to give Nero a good character. I think that's really quite difficult. And uh, historians are agreed on this, although uh, in terms of the Roman historians of the second century, there are disagreements and genuine disagreements as to what was known or what was likely to have been true about, um, uh, who's going to say Donald Trump, um, but uh, Lucius Domitius Ahinobarbus Nero, uh, his full name. And um, <clears throat> there, there are some things uh, that are in dispute, which nevertheless show up in Quo Vadis, um, you know, Christians being thrown to the lions uh, as one example. And some historians based on Roman historians uh, suggest, well, you know, it probably didn't happen uh, or at least not like that. And then uh, Christian um, hagiography, of course, uh, is based on the martyrdom of St. Peter and St. Paul <clears throat> in Rome at the hands of Nero's government. And, um, you know, Nero is assumed to have had some direct role in this, which may or may not uh, be plausible. Um, so all of that is sort of the basis uh, for Quo Vadis, and it is genuinely part of Nero's historical legend. <clears throat> and it's very hard for us to tell exactly where history leaves off and where legend begins. But fortunately, that period is, is one of the better written up in terms of history, even if its historians are now uh, no longer uh, read uh, very much. Um, my preference goes to Suetonius, but that's because uh, Penguin Books back in the 1950s published these uh, purple volume paperbacks. Um, and there was Suetonius, and I was 14, and I opened up, and whoa, there was all kinds of stuff. And uh, just the thing that would appeal to the 14-year-old mind. And um, of course, that's another link with Donald Trump, although I do think that his mind is not as mature uh, as 14. Um, so uh, I'm now inflicting this on my students, and they're really going to... Uh, get an earful and an eyeful uh, when they get down to the, the Emperor uh, Nero. Now Nero did do some things that are pretty well attested. Uh, most historians are agreed among them. Um, for example, he murdered his mother. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is a relatively rare event uh, in the annals of crime. It does happen. Um, and there are very few world leaders who can be said to have murdered their mothers and uh, survived to tell the tale. But uh, Nero tried not once, but thrice <clears throat> to do it. Um, he tried to poison her, it didn't work. <laughs> she was a tough old bird. And then uh, uh, he tried to drown her in a collapsible boat. And you'll uh, be happy to know that Roman technology was up to this. And, um, but she was a very strong swimmer. As I said, she was a tough old bird. Um, and so she, eventually uh, he turned to one of his um, ex-slaves in Roman, they're, you know, they're called freedmen. Um, he turned to a freedman and um, gave him the tip and the wink. And the freedman got the idea. <clears throat> and um, this is also a characteristic of Trump, by the way. You know, you sort of, and, all right, so, she was dispatched uh, in a more usual way uh, by being stabbed. Um, so it is, a, it is a sense that Nero um, didn't have a very strong sense of family. Um, 
and or if he did have a sense of family that it was more closely related to the Munsters or the Adams family or the Jukes family of sociological history. Um, and um, Nero obviously had um, very, very few scruples. Now, I mean, to be fair, <clears throat> Nero might have worried that his mother Agrippina uh, would get him if he didn't get her first. And that is conceivable given family relations among the Caesars. And so you could argue, as Trump probably would argue, that it was just a matter of self-defense. And um, <clears throat> uh, certainly her death uh, did nothing to make him unpopular among the, the mob, which of course is another resemblance uh, between ancient Rome and contemporary Washington, DC. Um, we didn't usually use the term mob again until recently. It does exist. It's a very strong uh, word in American history, British history. Um, very few societies were without their mob. <clears throat> and it is to Donald Trump that we owe the reemergence of the mob as a factor in um, the analysis of, uh, of history and uh, contemporary politics. So um, again, it, Trump keeps bringing up things, of course, not with any particular knowledge. I, we know that Donald Trump is probably literate um, in English, um, not in his ancestral German. Um, and we know that he had various degrees. Um, and it seems absolutely certain that he got his BA thanks to the efforts of his sister, Marianne, uh, who um, wrote his papers for him. <clears throat> and then we know, I think, I, I mean, I would, I would put it at about 98% probability uh, that he hired somebody to do his exams at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, about which he boasts, of course. Um, <laughs> that, uh, like everything else from Trump, it is um, uh, a bit of a phony. We owe this to the modern Suetonius, uh, which is this book, which I hope will have the same kind of immortality as the Roman historians. Um, I hate to say that, that that's, that's really a bit of a rhetorical throwaway because it's not really a very good book. Um, <clears throat> but it does give you uh, Trump family values and it does give you a sense of life among the Trumps uh, that um, in some respects is really very sad um, because this is a book that is really a tribute to Donald's brother and Mary Trump's father. Um, and um, <clears throat> it is a chronicle of how badly uh, her, her father uh, was treated by uh, the rest of the family. Um, that's the motivation, and of course it is a lot of the, uh, of the evidence, uh, but it does push her beyond. And there are parts of the book that deal with the more general uh, meaning, the more general diagnosis, I suppose, uh, that you might come to about uh, Donald Trump. Now, if I could switch mainly to Donald Trump uh, at this point, I mean, I don't, I really don't have to go into the particular details of Trump's career, especially since 2017. Um, I think that uh, to virtually every biographer, except Conrad Black, uh, to know him is to loathe him. Um, I mean, the man that he, uh, oh, the man who ghost wrote his book, The Art of the Deal, uh, hates him. Um, there's a chap in Syracuse uh, who hates him. Uh, you could just go down the list. And um, to know him is, is certainly not, uh, not to love him. Um, and so you've all probably read that, um, and it has been um, explained away by the Trumpists 
as examples of people just hating Donald Trump, although they never go into why exactly people have this passionate hatred for Donald Trump. Um, the collection of psychiatrists and psychologists that I referred to earlier um, disagreed on a variety of things. To me, the most powerful essay in the book was by a psychologist, and it used the term malignant narcissist. And um, it struck me then, it strikes me now, uh, that that was a very accurate definition. And it is one that, although it was founded really purely on Trump's public career, there was a lot of evidence about Trump's public career. And now from much closer, it is exactly what Mary Trump is saying in her book about her uncle. And to deal with a malignant narcissist, um, or sometimes friends of mine call him sociopath, um, to deal with that kind of character, you really are outside the normal bounds of historical or even political science analysis. It really is very hard uh, to come to grips with it. And um, we're just not set up to do it. Uh, and ne But nevertheless, I reasonably convinced that most historical uh, analyses of Donald Trump are going to return time and again uh, to this phrase. Now it's not as I understand it, and of course, this is far from my field. Um, I only dip into it periodically like a magpie looking for something glittering. But this glittering thing um, does seem to me to explain a lot. Malignant? I don't think that anybody can quarrel with the description malignant about Donald Trump. And narcissist? Um, virtually everybody, including members of his cabinet, have commented that really Trump is interested only in Trump and his idea of good, his idea of proper policy is something that will benefit himself and probably himself alone. Um, there is some question about his relationship to his family, um, his daughter, uh, his two um, charmless sons, um, but not, not even his sister, Mary Ann, <clears throat> likes him. I mean, you know, Donald got her a federal judgeship, but nevertheless, uh, she still um, sits down with her niece, who, who was secretly recording this. I mean, this is just wonderful. It, it's, it's like the court of the Borges. And, um, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> there is Mary Ann talking on about Donald. There's Mary saying, well, very interesting. Do you mind if I move my purse closer? Um, and so we actually have uh, quite, um, I think, quite acceptable testimony uh, from someone who's even closer to Donald uh, than, is, uh, than, is, is, than is his niece. Uh, so uh, malignant, narcissist, and of course there are degrees of narcissism. <clears throat> and in some cases, narcissism is a spur to ambition and performance, mild kind of narcissism. Um, you know, you could probably think of a fair number of politicians, even Canadian politicians, who could, in a mild kind of way, be described as narcissists. And, um, you know, I use the term myself, but in a, a gentle way. So, you know, I don't really believe that Minister X is really a deep dyed narcissist. And then there's the question of translating it into the term sociopath. Um, now here, I must admit our political discourse has expanded. I mean, you know, my memory goes back to the days of Louis Saint-Laurent, Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson. And, um, you know, it never, I don't think I ever heard the term sociopath used to describe a prominent politician <clears throat> and to have it pass unquestioned. <clears throat> unless there's a political scientist in the room. And um, I, a friend of mine um, who teaches at US Naval War College, um, a regular um, 
on the Lincoln Project, um, where they use sociopaths sort of as kind of, kind of um, coin of the realm. <clears throat> and again, the idea that this guy is out for himself, himself alone, and can only be understood and dealt with in terms that uh, will take into account that the person sitting opposite you in the room has no conscience, <clears throat> has no ethics, has no sense of priorities except those things that he perceives to be uh, beneficial uh, to himself. He is limited in terms of his education. He is limited in terms of what he's heard of. And of course, you're best off if he's never heard of you. Uh, in that case, you can carry on your life and Donald um, will probably leave you um, alone. But this does suggest the problem that we in Canada, we and the government of Canada have had in dealing with, what shall I say? I mean, if I, if I listen or look at any American TV station, it really doesn't take very long before they say, and we are the most powerful country in the world, and the president is the leader of the free world, and so on. <clears throat> this is always calculated to get any Canadian um, somewhat indignant, and it's probably a litmus test to discover whether somebody really is a Canadian. You know, you just have to set them down and say, well, you know, the United States is this, that, and the other. Well, we saw it, of course, on display for, uh, for real in the Charlevoix summit of 2018, the most disastrous of uh, the group of seven summits, I think it'd be fair to say, although Peter could correct me, but I really don't think that there was anything ever uh, that matched it. And um, it was a case where um, Donald Trump had actually to be somewhere for about 36 hours, I think, and uh, where he cut his visit as short as humanly possible. Um, and where it was really quite clear that everybody else in the room disliked him, <clears throat> including his own staff, including even somebody like John Bolton, uh, who isn't really all that high up uh, the evolutionary scale. So um, it gave us an insight, it gave us an illustration of what it was like to deal with this person again. You know, if you look at the image, and the image that sticks in your mind is Donald Trump sitting back, looking arrogant, gloomy, angry, Angela Merkel leaning forward, <coughs> apparently desperately trying to make contact intellectually or policy or some other way with Donald Trump and others like Abe, the Japanese prime minister, standing around looking distressed, Abe probably wondering where his samurai sword is. And, um, and so you, you do get a sense of it. You, get a, you got a sense immediately afterwards when Prime Minister Trudeau said something that in ordinary discourse would be quite anodyne, um, but nevertheless was not fulsome in terms of its uh, characterization of Donald Trump or his suite. So we in Canada um, are more affected, I think, by virtually any American policy than any other country on earth. And so it matters a great deal to us how we deal with the United States. It matters a great deal to us how we deal with uh, Donald Trump with the president. And the way Canadian-American relations work, generally speaking, is they're not important enough to come to the president's notice. I mean, it very seldom happens that Canada is on uh, the topmost American agenda. There's only one president, no, two presidents for whom this was not true. Uh, one was Franklin Roosevelt, and the other was John F. Kennedy. Um, but all other American presidents uh, really have no particular interest and no need actually to deal with Canada. Um, and so it goes down. Um, if it gets to the Secretary of State level, um, it's really of no concern. 
I talked to one of the American secretaries of state, and he said, well, yes, you know, I, I was a professional diplomat, and I was in the room many times with Canadians. And he said, you know, I don't remember anything they said. I only remember one personality, and <clears throat> this is one that might slightly disprove my case, uh, but this was a guy who had such a spectacular, explosive, and humorous personality that people did remember. And he said, oh, yes, I do remember Ross. You know, if Ross was talking, I'd go up because I knew that I would be amused. And, um, but apart from that, and Ross, by the way, was chastised by Trudeau, uh, this, uh, the father, uh, for um, getting out of line in Canada. So maybe he's very Canadian. Canadian. Eagleburger then said, well, you know, where I remember the Canadians, is on economic discussions. And he said, you know, this is not my area, but Canada didn't matter politically, didn't matter diplomatically, didn't matter militarily, as far as I was concerned, but they did matter when it came to economics, when it came to trade, when it came to international economic institutions, Canada was important, but otherwise not. And so, and that's by the way, a view shared by Henry Kissinger, uh, very much so. And because Kissinger wasn't interested in economics either, uh, that meant that Canada never came to his attention. Although Trudeau liked Kissinger because, and Trudeau, the, uh, the real Trudeau, um, would have him up uh, to Ottawa once a year. It was one of the perks of his office and Kissinger would come up and he would pontificate and, um, and Trudeau would have him escorted by uh, one of his ex-girlfriends, um, and um, <clears throat> after some fete with the prime minister, the two of them wandered out to the car and wondered what to do next, and she said, well, why don't you come back to my place, and um, believe me, there was nothing, as Kissinger learned, although I may not have known initially, uh, this meant nothing of the kind that you're probably thinking, um, she got home and there was her lover uh, who was stark naked. <laughs> and there was Kissinger, who, although interested in naked bodies, was not generally, <clears throat> not generally the male. Um, so Kissinger kind of liked Canada, but he wasn't interested in it. Um, and I have him on tape. Um, I have him in transcript talking about Canada. Oh, I, this is not important. No, show me something why I should be interested in Canada. His brother, who has a perfect American accent, always comments that Henry sort of puts it on. I'm inclined to think that that, that is true, although he's grown into the role. Um, so not at the Secretary of State level, not usually at the Secretary of the Treasury level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It goes down usually uh, to the Director General level as we would call it in the Canadian public service. And at that level, uh, that's where policy is made. And that's where Canada fits in, in the American uh, bureaucracy. So <clears throat> Trump, Trump is curiously immune to this situation. What I've just described <clears throat> is the deep state. All right, you know, deep state goes down, 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 until you finally reach Canada. Well, Trump resents the deep state. And so there is a disruptive quality uh, to Donald Trump uh, that is potentially bad news for Canada. And um, Trump has, it's not true that Trump doesn't have some fixed beliefs. Um, one of them obviously is in capital punishment. They, electrocuted more people in the last two weeks of Trump's presidency than they had in the previous 20 years. And you have to see, see that this, this has something to do with his psychology. Um, and Trump, well, we've already mentioned it, he likes parades. <clears throat> and he likes force and he likes brutality. These things all go together, I think, in his mind. And, um, and these are things that he is enthusiastic about, I'm quite sure. Um, and then it gets to economics. Don't forget he went to the Wharton School in <laughs> the University of Pennsylvania, which surely must now be kicked out of the Ivy League. Um, 
for that, uh, for allowing that to happen. Um, what did he pick up? Well, he picked up about tariffs. Um, tariffs, his understanding of tariffs is roughly the understanding of an average American Republican politician in 1880. Um, I mean, tariffs are a purely domestic concern uh, and they are used to satisfy domestic interest groups. And um, they are a way of blasting your way into the markets of the world. I mean, it's, it is a, a, a sort of economization of force. Okay, I, I think force is not, cannot be separated uh, from uh, this aspect of his policy. And he really does believe, as R.B. Bennett once believed, that you use tariffs as a club. And it didn't work with Bennett, but then Canada was a country of 11 million people. Uh, it could work with Trump because the United States is 320 million people and it is very rich indeed. Um, and so it was applied to us, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the club and the tariff. And um, Trump wanted to get his way with Canada. Um, I don't think he had any liking for Trudeau but I don't think it would be correct to say that he had any particular dislike for Trudeau either. Uh, he simply would have assumed that he was part of his sycophantic court. And I'm not saying that Trudeau attempted to be sycophantic or was sycophantic, but I think that's probably how Trump would have looked at it. And so we, um, we came up with uh, a problem with American trade policy. Now, <clears throat> I'm no fan of American trade policy. Um, I'm no fan of American trade policy as it existed before Trump, and I'm probably not going to be a fan of American trade policy as it exists under, under Biden. Um, the presidents prior to Trump and Biden, I think it's not really their fault, but it is the American system which generates um, usually bad outcomes as far as Canada uh, is concerned. But they're not, they're not catastrophically bad. We, we live with them. With Trump, <clears throat> um, tariffs are tariffs and balance of payments are a sign of national strength. And again, we're, we're getting into the idea of force and muscularity and the idea that you bull your head of what, uh, your way ahead. And so um, uh, and in that sense, um, Trump is actually not 19th century. Uh, he's 17th century. Um, I mean, this really is very close to French and British colonial policy um, around 1660. And, um, you know, and Louis XIV and Charles II probably thought, you know, very much as Trump did. Uh, Charles de Gaulle, by the way, was somebody else who shared that point of view, um, but his model uh, was definitely Louis XIV. So anyway, Trump or somebody clever in Trump's entourage discovered an obscure clause in, an, in American legislation that nobody had ever thought to use. And what it was, was that if the national security of the United States was endangered, the president was entitled um, to impose tariffs. I mean, nobody had ever thought of this. And of course, the, American, the Americans had never been in national security danger at least nothing that could be comprehended by economic policy or tariffs. Uh, but Trump did discover this thing, or rather somebody pointed it out to him, and then he wielded it with um, great enthusiasm, um, which incidentally, if you're a fan of American constitutionalism, says volumes about the American constitution and the historical basis for the American constitution, no taxation with represent without representation. Trump was putting down taxes like you wouldn't believe and he was doing it by fiat, which he obviously just loved. I mean, that's another aspect, force, power, uh, and, uh, and fear, because he definitely wanted to be, um, of you to be afraid. Um, so Canada had to deal with this, uh, much to our surprise. Um, Canadians are, are quite bad at seeing danger coming. Um, back in the 60s, um, you know, Trudeau and company were quite surprised when the Americans used emergency legislation. You know, Mitchell Sharp even went down to Washington and said, uh, uh, you forgot, uh, you know, this is Canada. 
Well, you know, <clears throat> if Richard Nixon had been paying any attention to this, neither would Donald Trump. So we had national security applied to us, which we tried to respond to in a rational way, and that didn't work. And then we tried to respond in a much more cunning way, which I think did largely work. And it did largely work uh, because we are in the deep state. All right, you know, if we can just get things moving in such a way that the president doesn't have to pay daily attention, uh, then we are likely um, okay. Now, Trump did have one thing. Canada did figure in his oratory. And um, he would go around and say, well, Wisconsin dairy farmers <laughs> are being reamed by the Canadians. They're treating us so badly. And he quoted our dairy tariff, which is quite interesting, very high. Um, I always wondered, you know, why the hell does he bring it up? And the answer, because some people have suggested that Trump is the agent of a foreign power, the answer is to be found in the Manchurian candidate, where Angela Lansbury is sitting with her clueless US senator husband, uh, who is a kind of McCarthy sub. And, um, <clears throat> and she said, you know, honey, you know, the member of communists in the State Department, I could never remember. And people are starting to treat me like a fool because I never get it right. Said, honey, would it really help? Yes, she said. She looked at the table and there was a bottle of Heinz 57 ketchup. And the light goes on and he says there are 57 communists in the State Department. I think that he went on about Wisconsin dairy farmers because the only thing he could remember. And it also says something about um, Donald Trump as, uh, as an intellect. So this is a rather long discourse. I, my sixth sense tells me that I must be approaching if I have not surpassed the magic 50 minute hour. Um, and so, and usually what I do, well, what I did with my students is I would look at them and I would, if I had notes, I would have picked them up. Uh, but as it was, I would just leap from the podium and head out the stairs and um, wave. Um, but luckily, um, well, luckily for me, and luckily for you, uh, we could have uh, a Q&A 